Now that we've gotten comfortable with various series and deciding if a series converges or diverges, we're going to look at some specific series that have some important properties that actually make calculus a lot easier to work with when the equations are complex. Our question's going to be, when does a power series converge? So first, we got to make sure we understand what we're talking about when I say power series. A power series is a very special series. It can be either centered at 0 or any other value. So first, kind of the simple version of a power series is a power series centered at x equals 0 is of the form the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of some constant, and that constant varies based on the term, times x to the n power. In other words, if I wrote it out, it's basically a polynomial. The first constant plus another constant times x plus another constant times x squared, plus another constant times x cubed, and so on and so on. And this is when the power series is centered at 0. We can shift it and actually do a power series centered at x equals a some other number, which is of the form the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of those same constants. But now instead of x, it's going to be x minus a to the n power, which means if we were to write this out, when n is 0, the x part goes away. And so we get the first constant, or c sub 0, plus c1 times x minus a to the first power, plus the next constant times x minus a to the second power, plus the next constant times x minus a to the third power, and so on and so forth. And so let's take a look at some examples of power series so we can get an idea of what we're talking about. An example of a power series would be something like 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed, and so on and so forth. That's a power series because we're looking at all the different powers of x. We could even write that as equal to the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of x to the n power. In fact, we can make our power series as interesting as we want. Maybe we could make it 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus and so on, where we're dividing by the exponent factorial. You know, you can kind of see um, the first one we're dividing by 1 factorial and 0 factorial as well. But both those are equal to 1, so we don't need that. So this power series, then, is really the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of x to an exponent. And then we divide by that exponent factorial. Let's look at one more example of a power series. We're going to do 1 plus the x minus 2 divided by 2 times 3 plus x minus 2 squared divided by 3 times 3 squared, plus x minus 2 cubed divided by 4 times 3 cubed, and so on and so forth. This is also a power series because we see that x minus 2 squared, cubed, fourth power, and so on. So what we end up with is the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity 
of the x minus 2 raised to the n power divided by, and what we notice is if we look in the denominators, we've got 2, which is 1 more than the exponent of 1, 3, which is 1 more than the exponent of 2, 4, which is 1 more than the exponent of 3. So we're really dealing with x plus 1 times 3 to the, and you notice the exponent is always 1. No, the exponent's always exactly the exponent. So the exponent on 3 is the same as the exponent on the numerator. And so we end up with this power series. In fact, we could go one step further to classify these power series. You notice the first two don't have that x minus a property. The first two are centered at 0, while the last power series, because it's x minus 2, is centered at 2. So that's what a power series is. Now that we've defined what a power series is, the real question is when does that power series converge? We're going to take a look at the convergence of a power series. And as it turns out, the power series The sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of those constants times x minus a raised to an exponent will always satisfy one of the following. It will either a converge only when x equals a, or only where it's centered, or b, it will converge for all real numbers, x. Maybe it converges everywhere. Or c, and this one's a little more involved, it will converge if the absolute value of x minus a is less than some value r. For some r, that represents the radius of convergence. I'll underline that term because we're going to use that a lot today. And what's really interesting, though, is while when, when x minus a, the absolute value is less than r, what we don't know is when the absolute value of x minus a equals r, it may or may not converge. Kind of to visually see these three options, option A, if I've got a number line of all possible values for x, and right in the middle is A, it could converge only on that value a, and then diverge everywhere else. So that's the case where it converges only at a. Or same number line. We might have a value a in the middle where it's centered, and it really converges 
everywhere. It converges for all real numbers. Or C, that same number line. And then off to the right, we're going to add the radius. And off to the left, we subtract the radius. And what that does is give us a range of values where it converges. And outside of those values, it diverges. But what's important to note in this case where we have a radius of convergence, it is not immediately clear what happens at those edges. It may converge and it may diverge. So we'll have to test those edges to get an idea of exactly what's happened. But only converges on the radius of convergence where the absolute value of x minus a is less than r. And then we have to really decide what happens exactly at r. So if these are the three cases for x when the whole series will converge or diverge, what we're ultimately interested in finding then is what is the radius of convergence? On what interval does the series converge and diverge? To find the interval and radius of convergence, the easiest thing to do probably is to use the ratio test, which we know if rho is less than 1, it converges. So let's take a look at an example of a power series and see if we can determine where it converges or where it diverges. We're going to look at the power series as n goes from 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial and see if it converges. Using the ratio test, then, we're looking for rho, which is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity. Careful not to confuse your variables. We're always taking n to infinity. Of the absolute value of the next term, x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial, divided by the current term, x to the n over n factorial. So if we simplify that, we get the limit as n goes to infinity of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial, we know is n plus 1 times n factorial times the reciprocal n factorial over x to the n, which is nice because it reduces with the n factorials dividing out. The x to the n divides out with the x to the n, so we're left with the limit as n goes to infinity of x to the first power over n plus 1. And really, it doesn't matter what x equals. As n gets huge, we're taking x divided by a huge number, which means this is going to equal 0. In other words, rho is equal to 0, which is less than 1 for all real numbers for x. Whatever number I pick for x, rho will always be less than 1. It's always going to be 0. So in this case, what that tells us is the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial, this power series converges for all x. In other words, the radius of convergence is infinity. It will converge no matter what x equals. If I wanted to express it as an interval, 
it converges from negative infinity all the way up to positive infinity. Because rho is always less than 1, this power series will always converge. But that doesn't always happen. Let's take a look at the power series. The sum, as n goes from 0 to infinity, of n factorial times x to the n. Let's run through the same process with this and see when it converges. Well, we have rho is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the next term, which is n plus 1 factorial times x to the n plus 1 divided by the current term, n factorial x to the n using our ratio test. And we simplify that. We get the limit as n goes to infinity of n plus 1 is n plus 1 times n factorial x to the n plus 1 over n factorial x to the n, which is nice because the n factorials divide out, the x to the n divides out, and we're just left with the limit as n goes to infinity of n plus 1 times our x. Well, in this case, regardless of what x is actually equal to, when n goes to infinity, this whole thing is going to be infinity times our x, and it comes out to be infinity. To converge, we need this to be less than 1, but it is never less than 1. Because we're never less than 1, we don't really have a radius of convergence. In other words, what we can conclude, therefore, the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of the power series n factorial times x to the n, it will diverge everywhere except one place. Recall that we always converge at least on the center, at least when x is equal to a. Well, this power series is centered at 0 because we're not doing x minus anything. So it diverges for all x not equal to 0. In other words, the radius of convergence because we're only on one point, the radius is 0 in the interval of convergence. There's not really an interval. It's just the value at the center, which happens to also be 0. So that's the second case where it diverges everywhere except the center, which in this case happens to be 0. So when do we end up with an actual radius of convergence? Well, let's try that other series we played with earlier. Let's try the power series as n goes from 0 to infinity of x minus 2 to the n divided by n plus 1 times 3 to the n. Using the ratio test, rho is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the next term, which is x minus 2 to the n plus 1, divided by n plus 1 plus 1 is n plus 2 times 3 to the n plus 1, divided by the current term, which is x minus 2 to the n, divided by n plus 1 times 3 to the n. And when I multiply by the reciprocal, we get x plus 2 to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 2, 3 to the n plus 1 times the reciprocal n plus 1 times 3 to the n. Oops, I put x plus 2. That should be x minus 2. OK. 
careful not to change the signs, x minus 2 to the n in the denominator. Reducing here, things become really nice. The x minus 2 to the n divides out with the n, leaving 1 behind. The 3 to the n divides out with the n, leaving 1, 3 behind. And so what's left is the limit as n goes to infinity of an x minus 2 times an n plus 1 over a 3 times n plus 2. Not forgetting the absolute values that are around everything, because that's important here. Well, as n goes to infinity, we know the n term is going to take over. But notice it's the same n on numerator and denominator, which means we're going to end up with the coefficients of n, which is the absolute value of x minus 2 divided by the absolute value of 3, which is just 3. Well, that's interesting. Because the first time when we took the limit, we ended up with a value that was always smaller than 1. So we said it was all real numbers. The second time we took the limit, in example number 2, we ended up with a value that's never less than 1. So we said it basically has no radius. But here, we got x minus 2's absolute value over 3, which we want to be less than 1, which means what we've ended up with is an equation that we can solve for x. We've got the absolute value of x minus 2 over 3 is less than 1. Multiplying both sides by 3, the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than 3. Remove the absolute values puts x minus 2 between negative 3 and positive 3. And adding 2 to both sides puts x between 5 and negative 1. What we have is a radius of convergence. The radius is what the absolute value is less than. It's less than 3, which means it's going to have a radius of convergence of 3 wide, 3 to the left and 3 to the right from the center. And it will converge on the interval from negative 1, negative 1 to 5. However, we don't know what happens at negative 1 and at 5. Recall we have to actually check those values. So let's go back and check those values. Specifically, let's see what happens at negative 1. Actually, I'll say at x equals negative 1. When x is equal to negative 1, our original series, we're going back to the beginning here, this original series that we're working with. If I plug negative 1 in for x, I get the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of negative 3 to the n over n plus 1 times 3 to the n which is nice because the 3 to the n divide out, leaving behind a negative 1 to the n. And so we have the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n divided by n plus 1. Notice those denominators are just counting up. One, uh, when n is 0, it starts at 1. 2, 3, 4. We have 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, 1 fifth, 1 sixth. We should recognize that as the harmonic series. But because we have negative 1 to the end in the numerator, this is actually the alternating harmonic, which we know converges. 
So on our interval, when x equals negative 1, we can put a square bracket because we know the alternating harmonic series, which we end up with at negative 1, does converge. But we still need to see what happens at x equals 5, the other edge. If x equals 5, we have the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of 5 minus 2, which is 3 to the n, over n plus 1 times 3 to the n, which, when the 3 to the n's divide out, leaving 1 in the numerator, is the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of 1 over n plus 1. And so when we start plugging in values of n, we get 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 4 plus 1 over 5. We should recognize that as the harmonic series. And the harmonic series, which is not alternating, we've shown diverges. So at 5, it actually diverges. So we're going to do a curved bracket, which means we have a power series with a radius of convergence of 3, meaning x can be 3 away from its center. X can, the whole series will converge when x ranges from negative 1, including negative 1, to 5, excluding the 5. So that's how we can decide if a power series converges. We'll use the ratio test and find out, does it converge only at the center for all real numbers or within some radius of convergence? And we can figure out what that radius is and exactly what interval works for x so that the series converges. But why are power series important? Power series are important to us because quite often we can represent functions as power series. And usually, the power series is easier to do calculus with than the original function. So if we can represent the function as a power series, we'll do the calculus on the power series and save us a lot of grief. For example, we know the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of a times r to the n. That's the geometric series. The geometric series is equal to the starting value a divided by 1 minus the ratio, given the ratio is less than 1. Because if the ratio is greater than 1, it ends up diverging. So if I have the function f of x equals 1 over 1 plus x cubed, I could represent that as a power series if I can make it look like a over 1 minus r. Well, we're not too far away from a over 1 minus r because we've already got a 1 over 1. But instead of plus, if I make it a minus, and I think, what could I subtract that would be the same as adding x cubed? Well, if we subtract a negative x cubed, then we're in the same form, where r is equal to the negative x cubed. So we can go to our power series as n goes from 0 to infinity of a. a is the numerator, the starting value of 1, times r, which is what we're subtracting, which is negative x cubed, to the n power. Or cleaning that up, we have the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity. 1 times anything is just that. And I'm going to separate out the negative sign so we can see it's an alternating series, negative 1 to the n times x to the 3n. 
This power series then comes out to be the same value as 1 over 1 plus x cubed. Or we could write it out as the individual terms. When n is 1, everything comes out to just a positive 1. Minus, because we're alternating. I'm sorry, starting out when n is 0. Now when n is 1, we get a negative x to the third. Plus, when n is 2, we get x to the sixth. Minus, when x is 3, we get x to the ninth. Plus, and so on. I want to take a look visually at this function coming together. All right, what I've done here on Desmos is I've graphed the function we were working with, 1 over 1 plus x cubed. And then I'm going to start to build the power series that we found. The power series that we found was 1 minus x cubed is the first two terms. And notice that the blue line starts to kind of follow the red line. Now look what happens when we add x to the sixth. It gets a little closer. Minus x to the ninth, it gets a little closer. Plus x to the 12th, it gets a little closer. Minus x to the 15th, it gets closer. And as I continue to work through this power series, the graph will start to get closer and closer to the graph of 1 over, x, 1, over 1 plus x cubed, eventually leveling out at exactly the right value. So that's how we can find a power series that gives us the exact same graph. Let's do one more example before we wrap up. Let's look at f of x equals x squared over 4 minus x squared. Now, if we want to be in power series form, we're OK with the numerator, but we do need a 1 minus. Right now, we have a 4 minus. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor that 4 out of the denominator leaving behind a 1 minus, and now it's x squared over 4. But we don't like to have a constant in front of the denominator, so I'm going to pop that up to the numerator, which is going to give us x squared over 4 in the numerator divided by 1 minus another x squared over 4. Now we're in power series form of a geometric series, where we've got the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of the first term, which is the numerator, x squared over 4, times r, which is what's subtracted in the denominator, x squared over 4, raised to the n power. Well, if I want to clean that up a little bit, we'll have the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of, uh, if I multiply the exponents, we've got x to the 2n times x squared. Adding those exponents, we get x to the 2 plus 2n over 4 to the, we've got 1, 4, and putting the n on the denominator as well, 4 to the 1 plus n power. And we end up with a power series that's equal to the original function. So we looked at several things today in this video. We defined a power series. We're going to continue to work with them over the next couple videos. And then we looked at when the power series converges by identifying the radius of convergence and the interval where it converges. It'll either converge at the center everywhere over a specific interval. And we use the ratio test to decide when that is. And then we concluded at looking at why power series are important by converting a known function into a power series, specifically looking at the geometric series. Later, we'll look at other series that aren't in the geometric series form that we can still convert into power series. But this is where we're going to start with for now. So take a look at the homework, practice a few of these, and we will see you in class.